professional interest is, of course, studying the imaging on CT scan and MRI and the relative cardiovascular application. I'm quite sure that we will learn a lot from him. Gianluca, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, first of all, to the organizer for this kind invitation. And it's a really pleasure uh, to give this lecture that is mainly clinical focused, uh, just to better understand which are our needs and how you can help us uh, to uh, develop uh, this uh, uh, application. Let me just share my presentation. I hope that now you see the presentation. OK. So, yes. <clears throat> Wonderful. So uh, the topic is cardiac imaging, which needs and how we can, and which gaps and how we can cover uh, these uh, gaps. Of course, there are several fields in the uh, setting of cardiac imaging, which we can, uh, they, we can discuss today, but I have just selected ischemic heart disease because we can imagine this as the core business of cardiology in general. And I have just split my uh, lecture in uh, three, main part, the coronary plaque imaging, as consequence of the myocardial ischemia detection, and then what happened in terms of uh, cardiomyopathy and dilated cardiomyopathy and related sudden cardiac risk uh, associated. Let me just start from the two main steps, coronary plaque imaging and myocardial ischemia. Of course, I am a physician and I have to start from the evidence of the guidelines because this is the starting point to better understand where the guidelines fail. Uh, in the setting of ischemic heart disease, uh, uh, there was a very great change last year, uh, two years ago in 2019, with the new guideline as compared to the previous one, the guidelines published in 2013. I want just to summarize that the previous guideline published in 2013 were uh, mainly based on three steps. The first step was uh, to identify the pretest likelihood of coronary artery disease. So you have a patient with the symptoms and you apply some clinical score to predict which is the probability to have the disease. Based on this pretest estimation, you select the best diagnostic pathway. This is the step two. And according to the result of this diagnostic pathway, you decide the most appropriate treatment. Basically, the previous guideline suggested the one main concept, that in patients with the intermediate risk for coronary artery disease, you need to use a non-invasive imaging test as gatekeeper to invasive evaluation with invasive coronary angiography. First problem with the previous guideline, I told you that we use the clinical risk score to estimate the um, prevalence of coronary artery disease in that patient. But in the confirmed registry uh, experience that we published, the joined with Jim Min from Cornell University, we uh, showed in this paper that the prevalence of the estimated disease, gray bar, versus the prevalence of observed disease with cardiac CT is absolutely different. With a trend to overestimate the prevalence of coronary artery disease when you use a clinical risk score. And this is the first problem. This happens regardless of the clinical risk score that you are using. These are different clinical risk score. The physicians are extremely, extremely familiar with this uh, kind of uh, predictive model. But regardless of the score that you are using, the problem of overestimation of expected coronary artery disease is, is, is always present. The second aspect of the previous guidelines is that when you use this clinical risk score, you predict which is the risk to have a disease and you communicate this kind of estimation to the patient. But sometimes, despite this, rough estimation, the motivation to the, of the patient to apply a lifestyle change or to apply primary prevention therapy strategy is extremely weak because this is a generic population-based risk estimation. But a very uh, useful comparison with the setting of the forecast. Now with the mathematical model, uh, you, you are able to predict when a storm will occur, which is its power, what uh, is the risk to have a disaster in specific region. And we know quite everything of, uh, uh, in this setting. 
But despite this, we continue, for example, to build town, city, community in area where there is, this risk is very high. This is exactly what happened in ischemic heart disease. We know the cardiovascular risk factor, we estimate the risk, we communicate the risk to the patient, but the adherence to the lifestyle changes or primary prevention therapy is very low. And indeed, the occurrence of myocardial infarction is absolutely high, despite we know a lot of things regarding to this kind of pathological model. So, which had the gaps for this first step? Medicine is mainly population risk-based. And the risk model population based is not effective sometimes when applied individually in order to predict the prevalence of ischemic heart disease in that specific patient. More important is that when you communicate to the patient in a generic risk of event, a generic risk of um, infection, in order to motivate this patient to apply primary prevention therapy, this kind of the, um, uh, the adherence to primary prevention therapy is usually extremely low. For this reason, in 2019, the approach was completely changed. And the cardiac CT was introduced as a very powerful tool to provide an individual risk estimation for that specific patient in the field of ischemic heart disease. And cardiac CT is now classified as a class one level B of evidence in order to uh, rule out and rule in ischemic heart disease in patients with chest pain. Okay, so thanks to the new guideline, now we can imagine that we use a CT, cardiac CT, in all patients with suspected coronary artery disease. But what happened when we scan the patient? Which kind of findings we can find? Uh, basically, we can split the uh, observation by CT in two different chapters. The identification of the adverse morphologic plaque characteristics and the evidence of adverse hemodynamic characteristics as a consequence of that specific plaque. Let me just start from the plaque imaging. Here you can see in this slide the main characteristics of the iris plaque. I mean, the characteristics associated with the plaque at high risk of rupture we can detect with cardiac CT. The presence of a low CT number, it means that these are a lipidic spot inside the plaque, this is a cross section of coronary arteries. The presence of an apicking ring sign, that is the black hole in the middle of the plaque, suggesting the presence of a lipidic core, the presence of a spot calcification, and the presence of a positive remodeling when the plaque is outside of the border of the vessels. All these characteristics are associated with a worse prognosis, with an hazard ratio of 2.9, for example, hazard ratio of 5, hazard ratio of, of 2.2 and 2.5 again. This is very important because if you see the history of ischemic heart disease and the most important steps to improve the outcome in patients with myocardial infarction with risk of myocardial infarction, one of the most important steps was the introduction of statin therapy in the history of cardiology. Because we observed that thanks to the introduction of the statin therapy, thanks to the lowering of cholesterol concentration in the blood, we were able to improve the outcome of the patient. And for several years, we were convinced that the direct effect of the statin on the outcome was related to the um, cholesterol reduction. But the most recent experience uh, that we published uh, on Jack a couple of years ago, the paradigm study, uh, we observed a very new concept that the prognostic benefit of the statin are not associated with the lowering of cholesterol, but are associated with the change of the phenotype of the coronary artery plaque. And specifically, when you treat a patient with the statin, you change the phenotype of the, pl the plaque phenotype from the fibrolipidic composition to a calcified composition, because in this way, you have a stable plaque and lower risk of event. But the main problem is that uh, uh, to understand the phenotype change, you need to measure some parameters, some quantitative parameters that define the phenotype, phenotype change in the plaque. Just some example, total plaque volume, low attenuation plaque, 
volume of non-calcified plaque, calcified plaque volume, and there are a lot of other additional parameters that we can measure. But not only uh, we are interested to provide to perform this quantitative plaque analysis, but it's very interesting to perform a quantitative analysis regarding to what happened around the vessel and not only inside the vessel. And therefore, there is an emerging literature focused on epicardial adipose pericolary tissue quantification. Just look, this is a vessel con left anterior descending artery, left main, and so on. And the uh, uh, yellow color indicates the presence of uh, fat tissue around the cornea arteries. And you can measure the contrast attenuation around in this region. Some previous experience, specifically the CRISP CT study, showed, for example, that there is a specific cutoff in terms of contrast attenuation, minus 70 uh, ounce field unit, that split the population in two categories high risk versus low risk of ischemic heart disease. And the reason because the adipose tissue around the coronary artery is an indirect marker of inflammation. And the inflammation is the trigger of a plaque rupture. This had very important clinical implication because thanks to this evidence, it was introduced for the first time the anti-inflammatory anti therapy as a therapy for ischemic heart disease that usually was mainly based on the concept on an uh, hemodynamic concept to just uh, uh, restore the flow in the coronary arteries. We need to restore the coronary artery flow, but we need on top of this also to uh, have an anti-inflammatory treatment to avoid further plaque rupture. So which are the gaps to be filled for this second step? Plaque imaging is emerging as a pivotal task in cardiovascular imaging. It seems to be the most robust predictor of adverse cardiac event behind the individual cardiovascular risk factor or clinical presentation. However, quantitative plaque imaging analysis is required to apply this in clinical practice, and this is time consuming with still limited reproducibility. In this field, probably, probably the technology AI, radiomics, are tracing the roadmap for an extensive realistic use in clinical practice of quantitative plaque imaging. Let me go ahead. We detect the plaque, we perform the quantitative plaque analysis, and in case this plaque is responsible for an obstructive coronary artery disease, we go ahead in the field of fluidodynamic, what happened in terms of coronary artery flow. And therefore, we need, we need to be able to detect the adverse hemodynamic characteristics. In the portfolio of, diagnost of diagnostic tools of cardiology, we have several options to detect the coronary artery flow. And this is just one meta-analysis that we published a couple of years ago, testing the accuracy of the majority of tests available in the literature and in clinical practice, Triseco, nuclear medicine, MR, CT, and so on. But if you look the uh, top two tests in terms of diagnostic accuracy, you can find here, for example, PET, stress MR, and the emerging role of a perfusion evaluated by cardiac computer tomography. Uh, stress MR, I don't know if you are confident with this, is a very robust technique. This is the, these are three short axis view of the cone of the left ventricle in a rest condition. There is normal perfusion. And these are the same three short axis view of the left ventricle. And you can see very clear here and the black area on the lateral wall of the left ventricle suggesting the presence of uh, ischemia, low myocardial blood flow. This technique is very powerful with a sensitivity of 0.83 and a specificity of 0.86. And for this reason, it is one of the most robust uh, imaging techniques we have in clinical practice to detect, to rule out, or to rule in uh, ischemia in patients with coronary artery disease. Also, very robust prognostic value. I apologize the number are small, but just the concept to keep in mind when you have a positive stress MR, the hazard ratio for cardiovascular risk uh, event, for cardiovascular event, is a 6.47. So, very huge increase of the risk of MACE in patients with a positive cardiac MR. More recently, 
the cardiac perfusion by CT was introduced. This is a completely novelty if you consider that uh, from historical point of view, cardiac CT is an static and anatomical test. You can detect the anatomy of the structure and of the coronary arteries, but you cannot do something of, with functional characteristics such as myocardial perfusion. But uh, thanks to the new technology, and more specifically, thanks to the introduction of the wide coverage CT scanner that are able to acquire the entire heart in one bit, in less than one bit, uh, now we can apply this technology for functional evaluation as well, such as myocardial perfusion. And this was one of the first experiences published in the literature by our group on Jack Imaging uh, two years ago in which we have validated uh, the, my, the static myocardial perfusion uh, against invasive FFR. You can see that when you use just CT alone, just anatomy, anatomical evaluation, black line, the accuracy uh, to detect ischemia is 76%. But when you add on top of a pure anatomical evaluation, myocardial perfusion with CT, green, red, red line, the accuracy increase up to 89 uh, this is an example, triversal disease and the purple area indicate the presence of myocardial ischemia. This kind of approach is a static perfusion. It is a just qualitative approach. Ischemia yes or ischemia no, but it's not able to provide a full quantitative evaluation. In other words, not able to measure the myocardial blood flow. You can do this with the dynamic CTP that we can also apply. This is uh, again, our experience published one, one year later in which we have demonstrated the excellent accuracy of dynamic perfusion with the, an acceptable radiation exposure that need, needs to keep in mind always when you use cardiac CT in patients uh, with suspect coronary artery disease. I don't know if you are familiar with this kind of data set, but just an example, this is a dynamic acquisition of a, a patient with severe disease on the LED. This is the left, left anterior descending artery, left main artery, to stenosis, high-degree stenosis in the proximal segment. With a dedicated post-processing software, we are able to have a sort of a map displaying the myocardial blood flow across the left ventricle. And where there is the blue color, this indicates the presence of a low myocardial blood flow. You can put region of interest and to measure the flow, in this case is 45 milliliters for 100 milligram of myocardial tissue. So we have a very robust tool, myocardial perfusion with the CMR, myocardial perfusion with the CT, and probably we don't need anything more. This is not true. Because in this, published, in this paper published by Danish group uh, two, three years ago in European Journal Cardiovascular Imaging, the author observed that when you apply the stress perfusion in the setting of a patient with obstructive coronary artery disease as detected by CT, the sensitivity is very low. So, which are the gaps that we need to fill in this setting? If the plaque characteristics define individual risk, myocardial ischemia defined individual indication for coronary revascularization. The usual imaging modalities, for example, systemar or SPECT or PET, uh, could be limited by low sensitivity in order to identify the subset of a patient with the perfect storm, obstructive coronary artery disease plus ischemia, with a potential risk to miss patients with indication for treatment. This is the setting where, for example, computational analysis and AI solution could be integrated with the usual care in order to improve the diagnostic pathway. And these are some of our preliminary experience, some of this experience done with the group of uh, uh, Professor Quarteroni and with Christian Vergara and the other people of the team. Uh, these are some experience that they want to share with you. First, uh, to be able to do a sort of automatic reporting of cardiac CT, uh, because otherwise the post-processing is a bit time consuming. Uh, and we have developed an AI solution for that. What we demonstrated, if we scan a patient with the cardiac CT and the computer do the coronary artery stenosis evaluation and plaque imaging evaluation, we are able in a vessel-based model, uh, panel A, and in a patient-based model, panel B, to have a very satisfying accuracy, 89 and 78, to identify patient with no disease versus patient with any kind of disease. 
And this is just uh, 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 the workflow to better understand the concept. Imagine that you have several thousand on patient, referred to the card XCT, the acquisition is very fast, is uh, less than one second for each patient. But the post, the analysis, the post processing is extremely time consuming. But with this AI solution, you can evaluate the data set and then to automatically identify patient with card rat zero, that means no disease, no plaque, and you don't need to recheck this patient. And just you need to recheck the patient classified as car rods different from zero by the machine. This means that all negative patients that don't need the human application in terms of reporting. But when you find a stenosis, you want to measure the flow, uh, also to avoid to perform a true stress test, an alternative solution is a computational fluid analysis uh, of the coronary artery flow. We were very lucky because in the beginning of 2010, uh, I met in a meeting uh, Charles Taylor from Artflow, and uh, uh, we uh, were lucky because thanks to Artflow, we introduced for the first time in Europe and in Italy the uh, FFRCT analysis in clinical practice. Of course, I believe that most of you knows very well this technique, so I don't spend time, but anyway, it's a simulation of the coronary artery flow, and most interesting, you are able to calculate the fractional flow reserve of the flow point by point in the vessel. This is the coronary artery stenosis here. You can calculate the FFR after the stenosis that is pathologic as compared to the FFR before the stenosis. With the stent planner, you can also simulate the stent implantation and you can predict the FFR value, the, flow, the value of the flow after the simulated uh, 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 stent implantation. We developed a lot of experience in that. First of all, in terms of diagnostic accuracy. The FFRCT was able to uh, improve the accuracy of CT and geography alone of several point percentage. Uh, if you check the accuracy of CT, anatomical evaluation alone is 53%, but if you add on top the FFRCT, the accuracy is increased up to 81%. So very robust in terms of diagnostic accuracy. But in the platform study, also we demonstrated the cost effectiveness of this technique in clinical practice with three different papers published uh, in the last five years, uh, which, which was the message of the platform experience. When you use the standard approach, I mean the standard imaging test, and you refer the patient to the CAT lab by using the standard care, you have a very high percentage of subject with no disease in the cat lab. In other words, you use an invasive approach to rule out coronary artery disease. If you use the FFRCT as a gatekeeper to invasive coronary angiography, you, you are able to cancel 61% of invasive coronary angiography. You can reduce of one half the number of the cat lab. And the number of a patient with no obstructive coronary artery disease in the cat lab is very negligible. In other words, FFRCT is an excellent gatekeeper for invasive coronary angiography. And among the patients in which we have canceled the invasive coronary angiography, there, is, there were no adverse events during the follow-up. Just a very a simulation to better understand for people without clinical background. Standard of care on the ball, on the top and the FFRCT strategy on the bottom. You have a patient uh, with the standard of care referred to invasive uh, cat lab, and the majority of these patients are without disease. FFRCT strategy, you refer the population to the FFR, then the, the, the majority of these patients, uh, the um, uh, cat lab is cancelled, and just a minority of the patients are referred to the treatment. The benefit of this approach is the reduction of the cost of 23%. So that means in the field of ischemic heart disease, several uh, million of USD. If an uh, AI solution can help us to read the CT and fluidodynamic can help us to predict flow, we can also use AI solution to predict myocardial perfusion. This is our preliminary experience in which we were able to apply an AI solution to the data set of CTA in rest condition to predict myocardial perfusion with a very robust accuracy, 84%, that is very close to the accuracy of the true stress test, the stress test performed with the uh, true um, perfusion. And in the same line, we can do this 
with the mathematical models, mathematical models to predict the myocardial blood flow. And this is what this was developed with the group of uh, Alfio Quarteroni, and the first author of this paper was Simone Di Gregorio. Uh, uh, in this uh, experience, the myocardial perfusion was estimated based on some preliminary information that we have in the CT data set. And uh, it seems that it works quite well because in our preliminary experience comparing the myocardial perfusion, the estimated myocardial perfusion, the simulated myocardial perfusion versus the true myocardial perfusion in stress condition, you can see a good matching. For example, patient three, simulated the myocardial perfusion, uh, the green color uh, indicate the presence of ischemia, and on the top you have the true myocardial perfusion of the patient. And this is quite well matched in patient three, patient five, and in the other two patients. Okay, let me just uh, move the last minute of my presentation. Coronary plaque imaging is important. Myocardial ischemia is important, but what happened when the patient has the event? Because in this, in this phase, we are still before the event to avoid the event. But what happened when the patient has myocardial infarction and dilated cardiomyopathy? HMR in this setting is extremely useful because it's able to identify the tissue characteristics uh, uh, of the myocardial, of the myocardium after myocardial infarction. Uh, just for the people who are, who are not familiar with that, what we can detect with the, uh, um, MR, we can detect uh, the edema, that is the white color here. We can detect the myocardial hemorrhage, that is a black hole inside the edema. We are able to identify the scar uh, uh, related to the myocardial infarction, and we are able to identify the microvascular obstruction, that is this black color inside the scar, inside the white uh, structure. All these characteristics has a very important prognostic value. In uh, the experience that we published uh, on circulation a couple of years ago, indeed, in the prospect study, we demonstrated that the, uh, the weight of all these variables to predict event is uh, the following one. Higher weight myocardial hemorrhage followed by microvascular obstruction, followed by left ventricle dysfunction, and then followed by myocardial salvage index. And when you use a score based on CMR, based on tissue characteristics of the myocardium, the uh, prediction is the most robust. And the usual uh, predictive model used in clinical practice, clinical score, GRACE clinical score, or ejection fraction as detected by ECHO are not uh, significant anymore. This is important, it's not a negligible aspect because uh, when we use CMR to reclassify the patient, we have 31% of ST elevation of myocardial infarction patient uh, classified as low risk with the standard method, reclassified the HAP when you use cardiac MR. Uh, unfortunately, cardiac MR is very, uh, 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 has a limited use because there is no huge availability of the scanner. And uh, uh, for this reason, sometimes we cannot scan the patient with the CMR. But in this uh, direction, uh, there is an interesting evidence that some information regarding to what is happening at tissue level can be derived by HEG. This is our experience. I don't want to spend time exactly what we measure with the EKG here, but the message is that when you use the EKG, some parameters of EKG, you are able uh, to predict what happened at the myocardium level with a quite good diagnostic accuracy. However, some gaps are still present house in this field. CMR is the most robust tool to predict the outcome. Unfortunately, CMR is uh, has a limited availability, and we need to select appropriately the patient that should be uh, referred to CMR. Uh, EKG can help us, but probably a solution to perform a detailed interpretation of ECG uh, could improve the selection of the, person, of the patient that should be uh, referred to the, cut, to the cardiac MR. Last point, and then I move to the conclusion. After the ST elevation infarction, you can have a left ventricle dilatation. And this is uh, associated with the risk of sudden cardiac death. And you need to treat the patient with ICD implantation. But what we can observe, first of all, the parameter that we use in clinical practice for ICD implantation is the ejection fraction. Because it's quite intuitive that when you have a severe dysfunction, 
you have the higher amount of sudden cardiac death, 48%. But we can also have, for example, a sudden cardiac death in patient with uh, moderate dysfunction. And this is a problem. Why? Because the function is not the true surrogate for the sudden cardiac death, but the scar is the true surrogate for the cardiac uh, for the sudden cardiac uh, cardiac death. Scar that can be semi quantitatively uh, quantified. Number of myocardial segment with scar predict the risk of sudden cardiac death. We can also perform a quantitative analysis of the scar by measuring, for example, the grade of transmurality of the scar and the grade zone, that is the uh, scar region around the core of the scar. And we can quantify this and we know that it is associated with a worse outcome as well. And also we can quantify uh, this scar in terms of absolute uh, mass amount. This is a one of the validated cutoff. But which is the problem? The problem is that based on the software that we can use, we can observe some important differences in terms of quantification, and this could have important impact on the outcome. For this reason, we have developed the derivative experience that is an international multicenter registry in this field that uh, I have developed uh, joined with uh, Andrea Guarici. I want just to skip this because these are clinical details that are not interesting, and I want to move to the, uh, this slide. What we observed in this experience, that if the actual guidelines indicate the ICD implantation based on the ejection fraction of the patient, less than 35 or more than 35, our score is more powerful to predict which are the patients who really uh, have benefited from ICD implantation. And more interesting, we have a not negligible percentage at low risk, 29%, uh, of uh, a low risk for event, despite they have a severe left ventricle dysfunction. And this is just one example. So my last point, the indication of our implantable, implantable cardiovert cardioverted defibrillator uh, is uh, um, ejection fraction guided. The ejection fraction strategy seems to be ineffective in order to identify the right patient uh, for ICD with the risk to overtreat a low risk patient. Uh, SCAR strategy by CMR seems to be the right road to identify this patient, but we need to perform quantitatively gadolinium enhancement analysis. And the post-processing is still uh, time-consuming and not fully effective. And to this regard, again, technology and, for example, AI solution could be extremely useful in this setting. For this reason, we have just started with an Horizon 2020 project, the PROFIT project. It is uh, exactly organized in this order. Let me just finish with one slide. Usually I put a take home message in the last slides, but I want just to put uh, one picture because it, is, uh, it, it uh, explain exactly which is the role of the advanced cardiac imaging in cardiology, especially if joined with uh, high tech, high technology, such as the mathematical model, AI, radiomics, and so on. Uh, we are able to see behind the appearance. And thanks so much for your attention. And I want to thank all people of my department. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gianluca, for this very precise and extensive overall of the currently available knowledge. I think we are running a bit late, but we still have uh, five minutes for questions. While the people are preparing to ask questions, I take this opportunity to thank Alfio Quarteroni for this very kind invitation, all his team for the great work behind a meeting like this, and Luca Palieri for the technical assistance. Is there any question at the moment? You should raise the hand and of course unmute yourself and open your camera. Hello, oh, Tony, I'm Marco. Can I do a question? Go. Go. Uh, so thank you very much, Professor Portone, for this uh, uh, incredible panorama of clinical application and clinical images. I'd like to just ask you um, a question, a curiosity, let's say, about uh, the difference between uh, perfusion CT and uh, perfusion M MRI. Why, uh, why you are preferring to use perfusion CT on your, on your group 
And can you give us some more detail about this? Yes, this is a good question and probably there is uh, still um, uh, not clear evidence if they are equivalent or uh, if one is better than the other one. Uh, just, just some technical uh, aspect. Uh, MR has an excellent tempo resolution as compared to the CT, but a lower spatial resolution. And the CT is exactly in the opposite situation. So it depends what we uh, believe is more important uh, in uh, myocardial precision. Uh, I believe that actually the best compromise is reached uh, in CT, to be honest because of the partial volume that we can have uh, in terms of ischemia detection due to the low uh, uh, diagnostic, uh, the low spot resolution with the CMR could be extremely um, problematic, especially in case of a patient with not a huge amount of ischemia. Because in this case, when we need sensitive, we need to have a technique with higher spot resolution. Anyway, there are no still head-to-head -head comparison data in terms of diagnostic accuracy, so this is my preliminary experience. We are doing a study that is the advantage to study, which we are doing exact, exactly this point, quantitative myocardial perfusion versus quantitative myocardial CT, and I hope to give you, to share the results in the next year with you. Thank you, thank you very much. Any other question? Tony, if, uh, if there is, uh, well, there is Christian Vergara, first of all. Go, go ahead, Christian. I go as you prefer. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gianluca, for uh, this very inspiring uh, lecture. I, I just a curiosity. You, you mentioned about the fact that the adipose, um, let's say, a region uh, uh, around the vessel could play an important role in uh, pro promoting or not the inflammation. If I well understood, do you think this uh, is something that uh, it will be important to be included, for example, in our models? Uh, do you think that together with hemodynamics, the presence of this uh, region and uh, its role uh, could uh, be important for uh, plaque development? Yes, yes, it is important for a couple of reasons. We have two different kind of models uh, in the clinical practice. The very simple model, you have a severe obstruction and you have a flow reduction. This is the most sim simply model in which uh, everything is guided by the mainly by the diameter of the uh, vessel where there is the obstruction. Okay, and we know quite everything about that. Uh, the curiosity is when we have a pathologic flow in patient with, I don't know, 40% of a stenosis, 50% of a stenosis, that is a very mild stenosis. Some studies has showed, uh, one of these is the Credence trial that we published with the Lisley show, uh, has demonstrated that if you check the plaque characteristics of the mild stenosis with the pathologic flow, all this plaque has specific characteristics, positive remodeling, spot calcification, and uh, alter, um, uh, pathologic pericolary adipose tissue. What I mean, all these elements are pieces of a puzzle that influence the metabolic activity of the plaque that in this case is more important than stenosis to influence the flow. That is the point. And uh, we are in the field of non-obstructive cornea RT disease. That is a true challenge in cardiology because when we have a stenosis, a stenosis, we perform a revascularization. But we don't still exactly what we have to do when there is no high degree stenosis and pathologic flow and this is exactly the setting where myocardial infarction occurs as first event in the history of patient. And this is the true challenge for the future of cardiology. Thank you. Last Thank question you. for Alfio. Uh, yeah, well, it's a non-scientific question, actually. First of all, thank you for your very illuminating uh, presentation. This is really very inspiring. Uh, so many thanks. Uh, I have a question concerning um, a kind of, uh, say, um, more pedagogical issue. Uh, you are sitting in a place, say Milano, in a very uh, important, say, clinical environment, and uh, you are you are exposed to uh, bioengineers and people coming from, uh, say, technical uh, uh, matters. Um, uh, we are experiencing uh, in our math department how difficult it is to have people train for, uh, say, in the clinical images uh, analysis, say. And uh, I mean, I would like to ask you uh, if you can answer this question 
so how mature or how uh, uh, immature are engineers or are people coming from non-medical environment uh, when addressing the very important topics that you are addressing? So how much of your expertise you have to transfer to them and how much training is needed for them at pure clinical level, say? Yeah. Uh, of course, this is a logistic problem, not only for the uh, engineers or uh, mathematics, but also for doctors. Unfortunately, actually, it is still limited, uh, uh, the availability of the site where you can have a focused cardiac imaging training also for doctors. This is a, a, huge, a huge problem, still a huge problem, because the most common model is that the scanner are in general radiology, in which CT and MR does a lot of things, but not specifically focused on cardiac imaging. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I believe that, uh, uh, in my mind, the uh, engineers involved in a, a cardiac imaging project uh, should be extremely useful to have a sort of a clinical phase in terms of training in which they have learned to uh, do at least the post-processing, the clinical post-processing that we use with our software to better understand what we measure each day when we do a CADEC MR and CADEC CT. Just a basic knowledge, considering that you are extremely confident with the technology, probably your learning curve will be very fast as compared to the usual learning curve of a physician or a doctor that is longer. But is, I mean, just one month, a couple of weeks, focused on that, I believe that it could be very useful then to better understand um, the needs because uh, you know better than me uh, is that if you don't understand the need, you don't catch the right roadmap. That is the problem. Thanks a lot. Believe, That's a I very believe. synthetic and uh, appropriate uh, conclusion, I'd say. Thank you. I believe then Christian Vergara has a burning question, will be the last one. Christian? Uh, no, I have already done oh, the question. Okay. So, thank you. <laughs>